delighted today to be able to introduce my dear colleague, um, John Stratton Holly, um, better known as Jack, um, who is the uh, Claire Toe Professor of Religion at Barnard College and is currently the DGS, if I'm not misremembering, in Columbia's religion department. Um, and I would just add there that we seem to be featuring a lot of DGSs in our series. Um, <laughs> not the first. <laughs> um, Jack came to Columbia in 1986, following a PhD from Harvard and several years moving up through the ranks at the University of Washington. At least that's what I discern from looking through your various CVs and stuff. Um, back in 1985, so shortly before Jack came um, to Columbia, a reviewer um, writing about his work wrote, quote, in an amazing burst of productivity, John Stratton Hawley has brought out four books since 1981. Now this was 85 that this review was being written. These included um, Krishna, the Butter Thief, which I, I'm pretty sure was based on your dissertation. It sure was. <laughs> um, at Play with Krishna, pilgrimage dramas from Vrindavan. Um, Surdas, poet, singer, saint, and, and another um, book which was one of the innumerable edited volumes that Jack has done, often uh, collaborative, collaboratively, so really um, collegially um, developing um, various topics with um, uh, colleagues um, in, in various places. Um, and I'll just offer a small taste of this earlier work uh, from uh, Krishna the Butter Thief. Um, a, not a taste in the sense I'll just summarize. Um, he asked why the focus on um, the child Krishna's act of stealing butter in both the textual tradition and in present popular traditions and also in artistic representations. It's quite um, his, really you know, not limited in, in what he looks at. Um, so while meticulously, he asked this question about why butter, um, while meticulously tracing the development of the theme of Krishna from its earliest appearances through its, an elaborate, through its elaboration in, in Sordas's poetry. The answer I think was um, that butter, both butter and stealing are associated with love and its transgressive possibility. So, um, now I'm going to turn to another book review that is much more recent, uh, just this year, in 2020. Uh, the title uh, of this review by John Court is called Holly's Sewer and Beyond, a review article of recent publications and more by John Stratton Holly. And it also is a reflection of Jack's unabating storm of publications. So we have included in this list, um, Sordas, poet, singer, and saint, which is actually a, um, uh, a of his earlier um, 1984 book. Uh, and then a couple of books, uh, one uh, edited by Kenneth Bryant and um, Jack as translator, Sewer's Ocean, Poems from the Early Tradition, 2015, and Into Sewer's Ocean, Poetry, Context, and Commentary, um, which right, is, does, is more, um, well, you can tell by the title, it's, it's really sort of analyzing these um, traditions. And then Court's Review, barely touches on two additional and very important books that we will no doubt hear more about today um, that have also emerged in the past few years. A Storm of Songs, India and the Idea of the Bhakti Movement from uh, 2015. And this year's book, Krishna's Playground, Vrindavan in the 21st Century. To characterize one side of um, Jack's work that Court is focusing on in his I should mention 18 page review. Uh, so this isn't just a short 
you know, sort of quick glance and a, you know, sort of turn it out into a, in a, into a journal. Um, so to quote um, Court, for four decades, Hawley has been meticulously exploring the oeuvre of the 16th century Rajpasha uh, poet, singer, and saint, Sordas. His scholarship has spiraled out from this center to encompass other important poet singers of the early modern North Indian vernacular devotional traditions, such as Kabir and Mirabai. The history of bhakti literature, organizations, and religiosity in the early modern period, and the historiography of bhakti. Sorry, I kind of mangled the sentence, but it was you know just listing all the things that um, Jack covers in the in these books, and then a characterization of these books themselves. These two massive tomes on Surdas total over two thousand pages, meaning that Surdas has received a level of publication and analysis in a European language unmatched by any early modern Indian author. So this textual work exemplifies um, the close analysis of the texts that Jack has devoted himself to, um, techniques and critical thought that he has modeled for a remarkable number of PhD students at Columbia, students who have gone on to illustrious careers of their own. But one of the many ways that Jack is dear to my own anthropological heart is the way that from the very beginning of his research um, in Vrindavan in the late 1970s, he has also been an ethnographer, as in at play with Krishna, pilgrimage dramas from Vrindavan, one of those books that was reviewed in the, in the first early review, in which he translated four plays, not only as texts, um, but also uh, in the enactments that he observed during his earliest stays um, in the city. His newest book uh, returns to focus fully on how Vrindavan has transformed in the decades since, addressing full on the socio-political environment that shapes the development of bhakti, a theme that is also central to A Storm of Songs, a historical and historiographical study of the surprisingly recent development of the idea of bhakti within scholarly as well as public circles. So, welcome, Jack. We really look forward to hearing you. <laughs> Please join me. I guess we can do it at a distance <laughs> in, in welcoming Jack Hall. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Kathy. That's uh, certainly way, way more than I expected. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully <you> accurate. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll see. you'll be the test, you all. Um, uh, let me just start by saying, and I also see that, you know, Rachel and Fran are here on the faculty side, that, um, hi, Fran, that, uh, you know, you never know what life is going to uh, have in store for you, really, at, at any point in time, but but I have some, I have some years behind me now, and uh, I just want to say that being in the presence of wonderful colleagues is the most precious gift that any academic can have, probably the most precious gift that any can work, worker can have in relation to her or, or his environment. Um, I, one of the things I hope I'll have a chance to talk about today, just a little bit, is how much I didn't do. That's to say how much other people did for me or with me, things you know, where I was just sort of barely holding on to some wall and would surely have fallen had it not been for the help of uh, numerous people through the years who uh, covered up my own ignorance or to put it more creatively actually taught me or, or showed me how, how things uh, could be done. And I've had that pleasure here at Columbia. It's just been uh, Barnard. It's been just uh, an amazing thing and something that I'm grateful for every day. So. Special thanks to Fran and Rachel and Kathy in that regard, and also to those of you among the students whom I know. I see hiding behind black boxes, uh, David Silverberg, Silverberg, and now Gaurika Mehta has emerged in the light of day. Hello to both of you. 
and uh, Aditi Rao and Avnesh Mehra. I mean, really, this is, a, I had no idea who would be in the room today. And then there are those of you who I don't know in person yet and who I hope I'll be able to know. I see, for example, that Chinese is written across uh, one of your self-identifications. And I'm wondering if, I'm, I'm wondering who you are since I can't read your name. Can you tell me? Hello, my name is Lu Dongxin. I'm very glad to hear your name. And this means that, that it's like 10 o'clock at night for you somewhere? It's, it's 10 a.m. here in New York. Is it 10 p.m. in East Asia? Or are you actually somewhere near us? Yes, it's now 10 p.m. Yes, so this horrifying. Thank you. I mean, what a way to spend the end of your day. <laughs> well, and she she will be joining us um, in the in the MA program. Um, I I do know that, and uh, and I've seen I've seen your name, but I've seen it written in Roman letters. So thank you very much for vocalizing it for me, and to all of the rest of you. Thanks for thanks for being here. So. I don't, Kathy, I don't, I haven't known quite what to do. What I thought I might do, trying to uh, piece out your invitation, would be to, to do a little bit of uh, biography or autobiography, I guess, from my side, how it's felt from the inside to be doing this sort of thing for a while. And then to turn just a little bit maybe to A Storm of Songs, show you some, uh, some text images so, that, so as to speak about some of the hurdles that I met there, the difficulties and, and opportunities that I think the book actually uh, rests upon. And in some of those cases, it rests upon, uh, one might say, a thin foundation, or rather foundations that people might actually disagree with. So I'm not sure what's going to happen to <clears throat> how that book is received in years to come. It's a kind of invitation to uh, take a second look at some anyone happen to be listening, take a second look, if you would want, at some of the um, textual, actually, um, judgments that I've made upon which the historiography rests. And then maybe I could show you some uh, slides. I know some of you have seen these already, particularly, uh, I won't name you, uh, coming from the, the new Brindavan book, but maybe we could save that for later until uh, you've had a chance to talk a little bit. And if we're talking about the, the, the newer Brindavan book, we could maybe bring those in just for a little visual variety at that point. So is that okay, Kathy? No, sounds great. Sounds right. great. Okay, well, here's, a here's to you. <laughs> mm. Very what? good. <laughs> I see Kathy's at the end of her cup, actually. So yeah, it's the tail end. That was the last drop. You need a refresher. I understand completely. I may disappear from the screen for a while, too, but we'll see what happens. This is a custom hour of the morning for me. So anyway, I'm very conscious of the fact that uh, for the younger ones who are in the room, you, you know, you're, you're entering the – how shall I put it? The world of scholarship or the – if you're in your 20s or 30s, you're faced with uh, the, 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 the global COVID crisis means something different to you from what it means to me. Thank goodness we're all still here talking. But to launch into a public life or into a new phase of your study life at this time, uh, you know, is a, must be terribly disconcerting. And it takes a kind of act of faith in yourself and in others with whom you find yourself to, uh, to go forward in this time. I say that because uh, I was born in 1941, which means that I came to a sort of consciousness just at the end of the Second World War. And uh, I, I could scarcely have told you as a five-year-old what the mood of the nation was, but, but it was good. You know, we had finally gotten through uh, the war with, uh, with Germany and Japan, and things looked good. And then once again, when I got to a certain stage of my doctoral career, it was at a point where in the American Academy, Indian studies within the field of religion were just, was just beginning to open up. 
it would be unthinkable for someone whose gender and facial forms are mine to have the kind of easy ride that I had in the academy uh, as a graduate uh, from Harvard's PhD program in 1977. I would put it competitive terms. How would you be competing with people who had have grown up in South Asia, who know the languages from the first moments of their life, and who know not just the languages, but all of the cultural and religious context that comes with that, who have grandparents whom they can talk to and so forth. It's just a wealth of experience that I, I didn't begin to have. But, but the, in religion, in any case, the, the academy was opening at that point to the study of non-Western, let's use that term, religious traditions. It wasn't very long before, 1963 is the great date, when religion programs began to just turn themselves over in response actually to um, some legal stuff that was happening in the United States. It was no longer going to be kosher, so to speak, for a religion department to teach on the border of um, which I was going to say objective historiography. There, of course, is no such thing as objective, but historiography at a distance, let's say, if we're thinking in historical terms, and confessional religion. That was going out the window. And the way in which it went out the window was to usher in the study of what was then called comparative religion, or world religions is the name of the paradigm that was given to it at that point in time. World religions now has a very bad name for a bad set of reasons, I think. They need to appreciate what was involved in trying to embrace the world at that point in time. I'm not saying, of course, that the, uh, the let's say, American, in this case, perspective didn't matter. Of course it did. But still, this effort to try to move out into uncharted terrain was new at that time and had the potential to cause fundamental shifts in perception about religion itself in religion departments. So I was very lucky to be a part of that moment and to find myself when I sort of entered the job market, um, find myself in a position where um, departments of religion and other departments, of my, when I was at Washington, I was in Asian languages and literature were eager to uh, expand and had, you know, there was, there was public funding actually for this from area studies programs. We had a lot of things going for us that I sort of wouldn't have known. I'm, I kind of took for granted. It was a way to move. There was plenty of difficulty in entering the field, but they weren't difficulties that were structurally caused. And the case today is just so very different. So let me just acknowledge that and begin. Uh, I'm hoping, of course, that the terrible trials that we're going through will be, in the end, seen as a time when there, when new opportunities emerge, but we, we don't see that yet, so there we are. I see already a lot of time has elapsed. Um, let me go back farther in time. So who is this dude who ended up with you know, Harvard University. First of all, let me tell you the short story of that. The reason I was at Harvard is that I was rejected at the University of Chicago. Uh, that was where I really thought I should be going. That was the program that had the best program in, yes, Kathy, in psychoanalysis and religion or psychology and religion. Uh, Harvard was definitely a second choice. Chicago said at that time that they had so many students that hadn't finished up, can this happen at Chicago? Uh, that they weren't going to accept any that year. And they said, oh, you'll do fine someplace. Well, I had only applied to two plays. Harvard was my second choice, so I went to Harvard. But he's been very happy for me. I met Laura there, and, you know, a lot has happened, and thank goodness. But, uh, but it's all because I wasn't accepted in Chicago. So should you be rejected somewhere in the course of your life, remember, it may be a very happy thing. And it happened to me again at Williams. When I graduated from Harvard, this job opened up at Williams, um, that I thought was, I had gone to Amherst. So Williams was just up the road. My brother had gone to Williams. I thought, oh, this is just perfect. It's unbelievable. How is it conceivable that this job should open up just at the time that I'm entering the job market? 
I was so nervous that I slept even less than I slept last night. I slept like only two hours and I just bombed. It was terrible. Thank goodness I didn't get that job. I mean, I don't know what it's like to spend a life as Mark Taylor's colleague through all that many years, but I didn't have the chance. In any case, as it turned out, I was not imprisoned in beautiful Williamstown for all of those years, and where I would have had no urge to sort of leave. Now, Mark, to his credit, did come to New York for a while, but I'm not sure if I ever would have. I would have thought, oh, you know, just like Amherst, foo, what a great place to be. No, I was rejected. So I went to Bowdoin, and that meant actually, which was a great place to be, but I was just there for a year. And then I, of course, of that year, I saw this ad for someone to teach Hindi. Hindi, who, what am I teaching Hindi? But I applied for it at the University of Washington. And that just changed my life. First, being in a department where language and literature were taken so seriously, being around colleagues who were language buffs, uh, and being in a big public university it just had an effect on me that couldn't have happened if the Williams shop had come through. So all of this, I guess, is to say sometimes um, rejections are the most important opportunities you can have. Um, so let's go back a little further. Who, who was this little kid? Anyway, um, I was born into the General Electric Company. My father worked for GE through many, many years. My mother was a musician, a pianist, and organist. Uh, my father had some religion on his side of the family. His father was a congregational minister. So we had music and religion as part of the family. My experience as a child was that my dad was you know, so good at the things he was good at that I couldn't possibly go into any of those fields, economics, business, law, and so forth. The real things, the things that the world thought were the real things. I would have to go in some you know, backwater occupation, like say being a minister or teaching. And sure enough, that's what I ended up doing. Um, so the GE company, General Electric, and when I was uh, about 10, I suppose, I began trying to map out world history. And it emerged as a sort of graph that was where the earlier centuries were down at the bottom of my mental page. And then you went up until you got to the present era. And it also had a sort of Mercator projection so that you could see things happening in global space. And my image of things was very a very Christian image. So I had, if you see, if I, this is down on the screen. So that was sort of um, what I would have called Old Testament then, or the Hebrew Bible and so forth. And then Jesus came along, and then you moved up through the Reformation, on, 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 up, up toward the present, across the waves, and finally we were at the United States. And how was I so lucky? as to be born an American at that point in time, and not just you know any American, but right there in the center of the country, right near Chicago in the suburbs. What a fortunate child I was. I don't think I've ever confessed this to anyone before, but I'm confessing it to you now. That was how I sort of grafted out and you know that people said, oh, you can be president. Well, it would have been better than what we now have, but it didn't happen. But this sort of sense of possibility for white, male children born into the General Electric Company was just amazing. Of course, I had my own worries about, uh, oh, just, I won't tell you all sorts of things, you know. I couldn't play baseball very well, and, uh, and there were various problems, but still the general trajectory was there. But there was this other image of the world that I had, thanks to the fact that I had a globe. We had a globe in our house. Uh, do you all know what a globe is? No, only some of you know what a globe is. I'm sorry I didn't bring an example. A globe is a ball-shaped thing which uh, is on a peg. And you can turn it around like this and it has a map of the world on it. So this was not the Mercator projection at all. It was something circular where you, you could not see the entire world at a single glance, which is a... Oh, Kathy, are you going to show us a globe? No. <laughs> I hope so. So, you know, there's sort yes, of- Yes, I'm on my way to, to find- This is fabulous. The fiction of the Mercator projection is that you can see the world from where you are, and there it is. But with the globe, it was clear that you never could see the whole thing. Oh, fabulous. Here it is. Can you, 
Wait a minute. I'm yes. trying to find it. This is a very good globe. <laughs> there is South America. Why can't I see it? All I can see is me. Let's no, see. but you're doing a good job, Kathy. There's the globe and you're turning it. That is what I, what Kathy is now doing is what I did. I would turn the globe and think, wait a minute, suppose I had not been uh, born or sort of grown up in Lombard, Illinois. Suppose I had grown up on the exact other side of the world. Well, where would that other side be? And Thank you, Kathy, for this journey. <laughs> this we've seen you making your way through the housing, and good for you. Um, where would I have been? So it's hard, actually, to poke your finger through the globe and figure out who you would have been if you had been the exact opposite person from the person you seemed actually to be. So sometimes my finger came out in kind of southern China, or it would seem to be maybe in Thailand sometimes. But the point is that it was, it was in a whole region of the globe that I knew nothing about. So I had a sort of fiction that there must have been a, a, a twin there, some twin Jack Hawley that I didn't even know what his name was, and I wouldn't have been able to pronounce it. I still thought of it as a him rather than a her. But uh, so this, this image of a, a shadow presence that would be ever so different from mine somehow made its way into my consciousness. And that's what I think ultimately took over my life or at least some sort of balance between these two ways of thinking, that somehow you're destined to be where you are, but then what would have happened if you had been born in exactly the opposite place? What would your life have been like then? What if I had been born as a Dalit in India? What would my life have been like? No, I, we, I, I probably wouldn't be in this room. It's just, it's just chance at some level. So I think in the end, what happened to me in a lucky way was that, uh, that I found that life presented to me the chance to try to bring these two visions of reality um, together. And one, one way to say how that happened would be to, to look at what happened to me at Harvard, which was as you now know, that I entered in a program <coughs> focused on psychology and sociology of religion because I didn't really know what I was going to do at the PhD level. And then I happened to take, thank goodness, Wilfred Smith's, Wilfred Kento Smith's big course on called world religion, not world religions. He didn't want that to be plural. He thought that religion was a single fabric of which there were a number of local instances uh, through world history. And that just opened the world to me. I also had the very great luck that um, Diana Eck entered the doctoral program <clears throat> at Harvard in the same year. So when I was trying to figure, when I found myself just blown away by the possibilities of studying, you know, of finding out who that kid was on the other side of the world, <clears throat> Diana was there with her very steady hand. And, um, and I was, I was deeply interested in China, as a matter of fact. Uh, I had done some Chinese art as an undergraduate and began simultaneously in my second year at Harvard to study Sanskrit and modern Chinese, well, it was Mandarin, but, but it was taught very differently as a, as a spoken language. I found I just couldn't sustain that. It was just too much. So I had to choose one. And Diana, I sort of was very drawn to China, but I was worried about the fact that if I went to China in those days, I would have been going to Taiwan and my life would have been in the library uh, unless I had become an ethnographer in Taiwan, but I couldn't have gone to the People's Republic at that point in time. India was very different. There I was studying a classical language of India, so it was very much a language of the page, but I knew that once I was able to travel there, I'd be able to talk with people and that was it was that combination of things that really drew me <clears throat> as pushed and guided by Diana's very forceful personality and the fact that she indeed herself had spent some time in India by then and could testify to all of its, um, you know, craziness, wonders, difficulties, that it was a real life place where there was a lot to be learned. So something like that. Another component that I haven't mentioned has to do with, I guess, my own education. So 
I mentioned that I went to Amherst. Very lucky I went to Amherst because I didn't go to Oberlin, which was the family school. All honor to you, Oberlin. Hail to thee, Oberlin, honored mother. Uh, very great college, but you know, but my whole family had gone there, so I didn't want to go there. I, I, I ended up going to Amherst, which, which was very lucky. And uh, all it lacked was uh, women, actually, in the college. That would have changed my life fundamentally, and that ultimately happened, but not in my time. Um, at Amherst, I was a history major, but it was really English that blew me away, but I was a history major. And I did a thesis on, uh, if you can call it that, an undergraduate thesis, Aditi, not anything so fabulous as what you're doing, but listen to this. It was on Marsilio Ficino, the Renaissance Neoplatonist. How I got to him, I have no idea. Uh, uh, but I was what, what fascinated me, well, I do know there was a teacher who was just great, who opened the Renaissance for me. And he left, so he left me holding the bag. He went off to MIT and had a great career, but there I was with just a little bit of high school Latin, trying to read uh, Ficino's De Amore, about love. And this is De Amore after the fashion of Plato. And Ficino, up there in Fiesole, above Florence, had sort of assembled around him a coterie of young men, and into which he projected himself as the modern day, that's to say, the 15th century Plato. So uh, that was all just fascinating to me, the fact that history was a performed reality and that you could return to deep parts of the past and attempt to make it your own in the present and thereby change the present, as indeed the Renaissance did change the present. So I love seeing your picture of you just below mine here because you know, I just feel as if, you know, for the current moment, that's just the kind of work that you're doing. doing. We don't know how it's going to come out. Okay, so my thesis was not the greatest work of, uh, of scholarship, and I was told that clearly by the history department at, at Amherst. Uh, it got a sort of B, but B meant a lot more than it does then, a lot more than it does today. Well, I got through. Um, but that effort of trying to make it back into the Latin with the help of a French translation, uh, sort of, I think, um, set the pattern for much of my life in that uh, I was going to encounter Indian languages at the age of 30 when you're no longer capable of learning languages really. But I had had already that experience of holding onto the wall somehow in this precarious fashion and finding that somehow I could survive. So I didn't have the linguistic tools that I wish I had had to be able to do it. But still, there was something to be learned there and I wanted to I, just, I wanted to learn it. So obstacles or no, I may, gave it a try. And that I think is what it's been like for me in my textual work ever since. I just without, I'm the guy like this, but, but people have come to me from all sides to help me hold on to that wall. And you know, then, then my name gets on the book. It, it's not just. <laughs> You can find the names of the other people just inside the cover, but 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 it's not but not at all in proportion to how they have mattered in the process. Next major stage of my education was at Union Seminary, right across the street here, which was a very different institution then than it is now. Although uh, there are threads of continuity for sure. Um, Union was a seminary that was founded or, or founded in a new way, really, because of Charles Augustus Briggs, who brought critical biblical scholarship to that community and was thrown out by the Presbyterians and by Princeton Seminary because he took this stand. So part of so there I was at, at, at Union experiencing what happened if you trained a hard scholarly eye on the religious tradition to which you yourself were heir. So that meant criticism, you know, the, the documentary hypothesis and the criticism of, uh, of the Tanakh, the, the Torah, on the basis of uh, JEP and D, the, 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 the various sources who actually created um, the Torah and other parts of the Tanakh, 
And then, of course, in the New Testament, it was the same thing, taking a look at, um, at the Gospels and trying to understand how those Gospels came to be written, both against their Greek and Roman background and also against the background of comparative work between them so that one could postulate a pre-existing uh, textual corpus that would have been drawn on by the writers of the synoptics. So it was extremely exciting to me. And I, there I learned that, you know, that the deep convictions of Christians around the United States were simply wrong. You know, Jesus did not say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He did not say it. The writer of the Gospel of John said he said it because that writer believed that that was the truth that Jesus embodied, but Jesus did not say it. You can see it very clearly if you compare it to the other Gospels. It ain't there and relates to the Gospel of John's theology of the Logos and so forth. I mean, you know, so that's what I did in seminary and then I started working Hebrew then. Again, a language that I have no command of, but it meant that I went to, um, to Jerusalem for the next two years. <clears throat> okay, so again, textual scholarship, trying to hold on to that wall and, and see through not just the sort of structure of the knowledge that I had taken for granted, but also the way in which it depended on translation. Uh, even, you know, the Koine Gospels, if you read the Gospel of Mark, with a knowledgeable eye, you can see that he is a native speaker of Aramaic. So he uses the Koine in a different way from the other two, um, from the other two synoptic authors. All of those, I think, as I think back on it, were lessons that, uh, that had quite a deep impact on how I would uh, evaluate texts that came before me afterward. And now we come to the anthropologist, Kathy. This is the moment I've been waiting for with you there. The anthropologist overtook me when I went to Jerusalem. You may wonder what I was doing in Jerusalem. Well, the easy answer is I was trying to learn Hebrew, which I had become fascinated with. I mean, a Semitic language so differently constructed from Indo-European ones, which is fascinating to see how the Hebrew Bible in its thought patterns was shaped by the language in which, group of language in which it was written. So uh, what would you do? Of course you would go to a place where Hebrew was spoken to try to learn Hebrew. Okay, biblical Hebrew is not the same as spoken Hebrew as you would encounter it in the country of Israel, but still. And sure enough, there was a lot to be learned there. I went as part of a project that had to do with Christians living both near Israel and in Israel, Arab Christians. So I was part of a group that was interested in Arab-Jewish relations, both in and around Israel. And I was there at the time of the Six-Day War, so that all just blew up in our faces. And the tragedy of, of Jerusalem uh, was just written ever more clearly on the wall after, in those years when I was there than, uh, than it had been even before. So this is where the anthropologist comes in, Kathy. I was finally was in a, a life situation where I was not a member of the majority, where I was a stranger. And that experience was, you know, deeply disconcerting and deeply interesting. And I think I didn't know it at the time, but that's carried over, again, carried over into my thirst for being in a place that would be strange and where I would be a member of a minority, you know, that where that kid on the other side of the globe would not be some shadow of my imagination, but someone real, and I would be a shadow in that kid's imagination, rather. My first taste of that was in, was living in Jerusalem. It was, it was deeply unsettling, and I think ultimately a, a great gift to me personally, although the tragedy of, of Jerusalem is well known and certainly not, not yet. That tragedy is not yet lifted. Anyway, then I took a year off because I couldn't stand it anymore and my mother had committed suicide and you know, it was just terrible. 
Uh, so there are personal dimensions to this. Um, but I got traction again and decided I wanted to go to the University of Chicago. I was always looking for a way to, I'm really talking too much here. Another four minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, well, and then, and then maybe link it to some of your... Yeah, uh, something a little more recent. Well, some of your current I work, agree. I guess. <laughs> and then I'll ask you a couple questions and then okay. we'll, we'll move into student questions. Fair enough. Uh, well, so, yeah, you know the rest of the story by now. I, went, I, I wasn't able to go to Chicago, so I went to Harvard in this program that really wasn't very great. But all that other stuff happened to me. And then Surdas came into my life just by accident. I read this very interesting passage on a single page that said he was a poet of the child god Krishna. I thought, yeah, that's weird. So uh, off I went. Spent a year in Banaras because I was in the wrong place. Nobody knew anyone in the place I ought to have been, which was Brindavan. So I got to Brindavan in the second year, thanks very much to um, a connection that was helped be made by my, my former TA, Donna Wolf, and later colleague who taught at Brown for many years. And there met Srivats Goswami and his family and, and the rest, you know, from taking a look at the parts of the of the Krishna's playground book, so that actually brings me kind of up to the up to the present moment. Um, about Surdas, I, I would say that all of those earlier moments somehow came to bear in uh, in thinking about this 16th century poet. For one, wondering what what our evidence was for the poetry that was attributed to him. That's our question from Union Seminary. How do we know that? So I went out looking for all the manuscripts that could be, be find, found. And as Fran knows better than anybody else, then Ken Bryant and I got in this, um, this, this shared project. Ken and I were not meant to be together on a daily basis over the years. But man, did he have skills that I didn't have. And I think I had a few that were a little more difficult for him. Fran was soon at uh, UBC, the University of British Columbia at that point in time, so you could sort of watch over the whole thing with your amused eye as ever. But again, I, I, I count myself very lucky to have been in Ken's present. Ken, Ken was a scientist, so he was not afraid of the computer. And without the computer, we could not possibly have done the kind of work that we and especially did, Ken did to take that manuscript work that I started actually and put it in a form where you could analyze in some uh, helpful way the different readings that emerged from various sources. And Ken way, way, way ahead of me and also was the person who managed to liberate the most important Suidas manuscript. That's a story also. So maybe you get some sense of how um, moments from this this um, past that wouldn't seem to have anything to do with, with India and South Asian studies did have a bearing on the way in which I came in. And Kathy, what you pointed out about being interested in not just the surdas that one could find in the manuscripts and therefore the historical surdas, but also the way in which his poetry is performed in the present day in the Ras Lilas of Vrindavan, those things went on simultaneously in my mind. And sure enough, it was the, it was the not dissertation that first emerged in the form of a book, namely At Play with Krishna, the plays, and the dissertation, which was far more difficult work in many other ways only came out later. Okay, well, let's, let's leave that. Okay, well, thanks very much, Jack. I mean, it's really fascinating to things I didn't know about you. <laughs> it's really, um, and, and hopefully helpful to students to recognize that the angst that virtually every student I know goes through in one way or another in its own particular form um, is something that even highly successful um, academics also go through, that we're not these superhuman beings. And in fact, that image of hanging on by your fingernails um, as part of my training and also as part of the traumas of having gone off to do field work and coming back, I went through a, uh, my own psychoanalysis and that was a 
huge image in my own analysis. You sound really? like you're just hanging on by your fingernails, <laughs> which apparently I experienced even from first grade. So, because <laughs> I was the youngest kid in the class. So, <laughs> anyway, so. Don't think thing. I didn't win going to therapy too. I certainly did, but <laughs> talk about it right now. You're right, exactly. Um, so I, I have two questions for you, and then we'll open it up. Um, you know, one of the big things you've done um, is, is, you know, translating um, Sordas's and work. Um, and, and you also mentioned when you were talking um, how structures of knowledge depend on translation. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the process of translation in the sense of your approach to translation, what you think translation does and doesn't do. Um, you know, there have been various theories of translation out there. Um, so I just wonder what your, what your thoughts are on, on, uh, on that. I'm glad to say a word or two about that. Um... And the first word has to be, I think, that, uh, that the process of translation is a great mystery to me. I don't actually know what happens to me when I'm in that room. Now we can leave this image behind a little bit and put myself in, I think of it as some dark room. So there I am with a, a Surdas poem at, that's written on the page, and I may have it in my ear if I'm lucky, if I've heard it perform. More likely, I've been reading the poem, which is not always an easy poem for Surdas. Uh, I will read the commentaries if they exist, if it's part of a printed edition, and then just try to sort of get all of that in my mind somewhere. And then I, you just have to somehow start. And my experience is that um, that I've just that there there's some part of the brain or self that then takes over at that point and you're kind of possessed and the process of of translating you know trying to find english words that somehow correspond to what we're seeing on the page in hindi and i'm trying to do it in some kind of verse form it just happens in a way that i don't actually understand very well then you go back and and try to correct and make sure that there's some kind of correspondence. But it's, I must say, it's a very mysterious uh, process. And part of what's crucial to it is then taking that work to someone who, um, who really knows, usually more than someone, right up to the last days of the production of the, the Murthy Classical Library, Surdas, uh, mistakes, or at least questions of interpretation were being brought to my attention. The great angel here is Monica Horstman, who was the editor for North Indian languages inside the Murthy series and went through every single word of that. And, you know, found, found some stuff that really needed to be looked at again. So, I don't know, that's probably not enough. And I should also say that my first translations we're, we're in rhymed verse, and uh, if you want to ever read anything funny, just get a hold of my doctoral dissertation. Uh, when I appeared for the, for the oral exam, Daniel H.H. H. Ingalls came with a volume of Matthew Arnold under his arm, and he read to me certain passages from Matthew Arnold, and he said, your stuff sounds like this. Might you reconsider? So then I had to sort of relearn what translation might mean. Mark Jurgensmeyer was very helpful in the process to me, and I just tried to listen to voices of people like Yates and so forth that I had studied through the years. So voices. Okay, thanks. Um, and then the other question, you know, you've, you've had this, um, Christian's Playground came out just this year. Um, and you had, as I mentioned, several other things that have, there has been a storm of publications, including storm of songs and, and, and such. So, um, so a lot's in print now. So what are you, have you 
moved on to a new project? Um, and if so, I'm, I'm curious about how you do that. In other words, how do you choose what direction to take next? Thank you. Uh, it turns out that COVID has a lot to do with the answer here. There are, there are three projects that somehow are in my head. I can even think of a fourth as I say the third. No, there are three. And they've all been sort of started at different points. The most autobiographical of all of them is, has to do with religious retreat plates, places in the States. Um, so I had hoped for a long time to be able to <clears throat> to become a sort of faux anthropologist and, um, and go to, in different parts of the country, a Jewish Buddhist retreat center, a Hindu retreat center, a Muslim retreat center, and a secular retreat center. And that would go together with some anthropology that I did to my own past in a place called the Congregational Summer Assembly of Frankfurt, Michigan, or if you want to know Pilgrim, Michigan, which doesn't even exist in the winter. So just try to set these aside each other. That hasn't happened yet. Um, it involves travel and I, I somehow I'm not there yet. The second one comes straight out of Surdas and out of the revised version of, the, of my earliest thematic Surdas book. And this is one that has to, it just happens. This is a book that came out, the, the revised thing came out in 2018. It happens that Surdas as a visual figure, the imagined Surdas in painting, happened in Udaipur. And you get, I mean, I can count 150 images of the poet in conjunction with poems from the Sur Saga that were painted in Udaipur beginning roughly in the middle of the 17th century and just an explosion of them at the end of the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th. So that's a project that can happen and I, I'm going to be doing it with Nivza Puddar who is a, um, an art historian now at the Philadelphia Museum of Art who is a PhD from Oakland who's known each other for many years. So bringing her art sensibilities together with whatever I know from the textual work that I've done. So that's project number two. But the one I really wanted to do was to have happened last summer and it couldn't because of COVID. And this has to do with Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, some four or five years ago, I for the first time had the luck to go to the Bachfest in Leipzig in Germany. So this takes us back actually to the, to the wall. My German is not at all as good as it should be. It's not as good as it once was. I can, but Bach has a very deep impact on me and also through the words, though I need to have the text there to sort of really know in detail what's going on. I wanted to do, again, a comparative project that would have to do with what Kierkegaard called um, aesthetic Christianity. That's to say what happens when a, a performed aspect of the past is treasured and carried into the present moment, a present moment that may not accept the presuppositions that would have been there in the earlier period of time. You know, Bach was the, was the great choral conductor in Leipzig in, in his time going between the two great churches. And certainly, and though he, he, though he wrote for both Catholics and or composed for both Catholics and Protestants, uh, he was very much a Protestant himself, or at least able to take on Luther. So he's part of a world that most modern day Germans are no longer a part of, and certainly I am not. This would have been a project that has to do with what happens to religion so to speak, when the belief goes out of it, but somehow the belief remains, what is that about? Hmm. So I thought I would try to put that experience of enlivening Bach in the, in the place where he 
spent most of his life together with my Vrindavan experiences. The carrying of a treasured past forward into an, an, a new period that is just fundamentally different from it. Uh, set those in comparison with one another and just try to think about them together. There is also this German project on the history of the emotions that I thought would be a good. Uh, so anyway, that's what was supposed to happen this summer, but because of COVID, it could not happen. So probably, uh, probably, what I'll do is to retreat to the text project, the Suardas project. I, I, I think I'll have a year off next year and really work on that and then see if the world opens up again in such a way that one or, or both of the others can come into being if I'm still alive. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> well, I'm old. Well, <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, that's the other thing about uh, life is that we do get older. <laughs> sort of pretend we're moving on full steam ahead and uh, yeah anyway um well thank you so much jack i think um it would be important now to i have so much i would you know love to ask you about or um you know sort of my own thoughts but i think i'd rather right now open it up to thanks for this opportunity yeah, well, it's been really great to, to hear it. um open it up to you all um and hear your questions, thoughts, reactions. As you could hear from um, Jack's kind of life story and some of my reactions, this is a, you know, kind of a, um, not a formal space. So thoughts at any level that you have would be um, most welcome. Uh, Avnish, I think I see your hand. Yes, hello, Hi. always good to see you, mm -hmm. Professor Holly. Thank you. Um, uh, all right. So, so my question was actually about your new book, uh, Krishna's Playground, because that was what we were reading. That way. Uh, for, yeah, for this week. Um, so. And he's holding a print copy. Yeah, I've got a print copy. Yes. yes. Thank you. I've got one too. <laughs> oh, awesome! <laughs> Fantastic. I'm glad you bought it. Uh, yeah. So, so I what was interesting to me. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, what, 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 what was interesting to me is in the earlier chapters, it seems like you have this sort of nostalgia for what Vrindavan used to be. And there's also a sense of um, maybe a, a sort of, um, I don't know about sadness, but, but just like, um, just, just a, uh, a, a, it evokes a certain feeling within you about what Vrindavan has sort of become. Um, and then when you get to chapter four, which to me is the best chapter in the book, um, you, you really go ham, I guess, with it when you're talking about the skyscraper temple. And the beginning of that chapter, it seems like you're in awe of everything that, that's happening and the plans and ideas of it and this Disneyland aspect of it. But then towards the end of that chapter, it kind of goes on this bit of a roller coaster ride where they changed the plans to maybe making it into a bunch of apartments. And then now it seems like some sort of strange mix. And I was just sort of interested in how this original idea of incorporating Vedic cosmology in this giant tower, um, you, you, you mentioned frequently in there, it has this Disneyland aspect to it. And, and I think towards the end of the chapter, you, you, you sort of say these, you know, very poignantly in one sentence, I resist. And I was just thinking about how, you know, this, this sense of like, as you talk about futurists and protectors, how this, you know, change is happening in India and how basically this capitalistic nature, is it such a bad thing after all? Right, because the society and, you know, I'm, I'm young and I'm hopefully inheriting the planet, you know, millennials. And I, and I just wonder, you know, Disneyland in America has done so phenomenally well and has brought so much business to this country. And India has such a rich story, even though it's thousands of years old and even though Krishna has divine elements to it, is this not just another story that they're trying to communicate? And 
I just wanted to see, and, and then my other follow up to that is this kind of left me wondering what's happening now, because it felt like the ending of the story kind of happened sometime last year. So this is just my very long winded question to you. Not long winded at all, if I can say. Thank you for reading so carefully and so picking that all up. Um, you're absolutely right about the tug of war between um, memory. Oh, by the way, what is nostalgia, we might ask, but anyway, memory. And, um, and the wonders of the present. I mean, geez, here we are in a Zoom environment. It's so amazing that, you know, the world is aff afflicted by this uh, awful disease. At the same time <clears throat> that we who are very privileged uh, have this major means of dealing with it through Zoom technology. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. Five years ago, this would have been very hard to, uh, to achieve. It's just, uh, it just, I don't know if you f feel that sense of wonder, Avnish, but... Yeah, but, absolutely, I do. Yeah, and you're a very creative person, so I, I love the, that you reacted to that chapter particularly. Um, the question about where it is now is maybe what I should turn to. I, I don't know the answer. I wish I did. Srivats Goswami is coming into the climate change course, the uh, climate crisis course that doing now uh, intensively, have been doing in block A of the fall. So we'll be able to ask him about things like this. So far as I know, the no, uh, no construction of the tower itself has yet taken place. The bank loan has been received. So whether it's still, you know, alive and well, I can't say. So they would, that's to say, Iskan Bangalore, which is behind it, would seem to have the financial wherewithal to move ahead but exactly what the shape of those plans may be at the moment, I don't know. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if they have changed once again because of, uh, because of the virus. Last I saw the site was, um, was in January of this year, where um, there was no, where it's still the big crater um, that's being prepared for, uh, for the tower. Um, there was no noticeable activity at that point in time, but, um, but I don't know what might have happened since. It's an incredible drama, actually, unfolding, it seems to me, unfolding, unfolding on the outskirts of Vrindavan, and I, I don't really know what's going to happen. Tulsi Srinivas, who is an anthropologist who writes about Bangalore, was just actually in the climate course. So it was fascinating to hear her speak about um, about Bangalore as a city built upon all this sort of waterland, which is no longer accessible to the city, uh, the story of uh, of uh, of ecological crisis. I'm I'm seeing it actually from a, a new angle because, especially of her work in in Bangalore. So the Iskon Temple in Bangalore, which is a glorious fair, affair, as it turns out, another sort of beacon to the world, is built at a high point in a city which now is basically unnavigable, or was before the virus hit anyway. To drive from one side of Bangalore to the other takes you four hours now, and the quality of the air is just terrible. Um, yeah. So if it does get constructed, and I'll sort of be surprised if some version of it isn't, for many of the reasons that you just suggested, you know, the, the lure of King Kong, uh, and of the, the, the vibrancy of, of the Krishna story. Um, but it's going to happen in an environment that's quite different, even from what Bangalore Iskon would have imagined um, seven or eight years ago when the idea was hatched. Right, cool, thank you. Yeah. Hey, we have a question from um, 
who I don't quite know who it is, but please <laughs> identify yourself. <laughs> Sorry, this is this is Kayla Kaiser. Oh, hi, Kayla. Can you guys hear me? Okay, perfect. Yes. Um, I actually just dropped my phone. Oh. <laughs> so I, I don't know exactly what I hit, but I apologize. Um, thank you very much for everything that you said, though, and it was very interesting to listen to. Uh, Hi, Kayla. So, so, so do, you, do you have a specific question? No, I don't. I'm sorry. I'm, oh, okay. I just dropped my phone. I don't know what I might have hit. Oh, I see. I see. That's, <laughs> it was the phone that was worried about the whole thing. <laughs> well, I can understand that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. I don't. I don't. Um, I'm not seeing specific questions um, right now, um, unless I'm missing them somehow. But so I, I would like to ask something that came up. You mentioned that you were teaching a block course, and given that my plan for um, the spring is to teach, teach two block courses simultaneously. I'm just curious to know from either you, Jack, or other people how the block course format is going so far, since this is such a new thing. And then we'll shift back to, um, we yeah. can shift back to- Maybe uh, somebody else would like to comment on that who's a part of a block course from a TA or student's perspective. Were you all too wise to take a block course? <laughs> yes, I see that Aditi Rao is saying, yes, I was too wise. Well, I happen to know what Aditi is doing. She's doing three classical languages in parallel. So they have to stay in parallel. Otherwise, imagine the chaos, even in the life of a person like you, Aditi. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it's been, uh, I would have, have to say, Kathy, it's been an amazing experience for me on two grounds. I mean, my course is special because we've had so many visitors, um, which has just been astonishing to be able to read, um, say, uh, Udi Halperin's marvelous book on Hadimba and his article on um, climate change and how it's perceived in the Himalayas, and then have Udi come in from Tel Aviv and meet uh, this small group of students has just been wonderful and mm -hmm. seeing each other on a daily basis has meant that we're really, we, we know each other. Uh, it's also, I think, pointed out to me, how shall I say, how much work students are asked to do. Uh, if you're doing this kind of fast work, day after day after day, you just have to be a little bit more reasonable about it. And yeah. uh, think, and to, you know, allow just a little bit of breathing room. And uh, so that aspect of things has been good. We haven't seen student projects come in yet, so I don't know how that's going to be. But um, I, I don't know, I feel as if we've been together around a, 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 a closely related set of um, places and issues uh, in a way that would have been very different in another format. Well, so that's, that's kind of what I'm hoping too, yeah. is, is that I get really into stuff, but dragging it over 15 weeks, you know, it's like, oh, all these other things are de making demands on your time. I figure let's just do it as if you're writing an article or something, just really focus for... Um, well, the other side of it, let me just say, at least in my case, since this was a completely new course, is that there's no time for anything else. So... Yeah. <laughs> at least that's my experience. Right. Um, okay, we have um, Aditi. Well... Um, the cynic in me has a question. Oh, good. Yeah, she's coming out. And when she says cynic, she means... <laughs> You know, not just what you and I mean, but we're talking. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's my, it's my today. <laughs> um, I, I guess I have this, this deep worry that this year, year plus distance that all of us are taking from our geographic area of study um, will cause some deep intellectual and emotional schism. Um, and I, and I guess I'm, you know, I'm in this room in New York and I don't really have many books with me and I certainly have no access to India. And even though I don't study the modern era at all, 
I feel more distant from the past that I do study than I ever have before. Right. And I'm, I'm interested in how you envision the future of area studies going forward when we have all just taken such a pause um, from understanding the realities of anything that's happening in our places of study. I would very much like to hear what, how the rest of you feel about this, both, both students and faculty people, because uh, mine is only one perspective. All I can say from my side, Aditi, is that this is the, f I realized as just as we began to enter into this course that I had always taught with the presumption that anyone in a, a course where I found myself would be able to travel to India if she or he wanted to do so or planned to do so or uh, you know could find the wherewithal to do it and that people would be coming from South Asia on a regular basis into New York uh, you know so to have that stripped away uh, you know it's a very fundamental thing and still keep hoping and I know that people in the course also hope especially those who have never been to India and there are a bunch um, that you know when it opens up they want to travel, but it's made us think, of course, about what, what travel means, fossil fuels, um, and who gets to travel, all of that. So, and amen about the libraries is just, you'll be, I hope, happy to know that um, three of our students actually are in New York, like you, Aditi would know that we, by chance, saw each other on Broadway when was it, maybe almost a month ago now? For me, that was the most fabulous thing. Oh, there she was, <clears throat> right there. And then we had a chance to meet out on the, in the portico of Millbank. And that's happened now with the three students on the course who were actually in time. That was deeply reassuring to um, have a sort of real-time experience with those three students. And you'll be, as a bibliophile, please, pleased to know that in the last one, we're talking about student projects, um, one is going to be working on the Ganga and the other is going to be working on Oroville of all things. So at the close of that conversation, I went upstairs into my library and pulled off the books that seemed to relate to those projects that I could do without. And so I got four or five books that had to do with Aurobindo and Aurovil and put them, yes, in a little brown a bag, just as you would get if you went to Butler, and carried it downstairs and handed that bag to one of the students. I felt so, I don't know, empowered, I guess, by the ability to um, put some of my library in the hands of someone who really would be using it. So, yeah, that's too long a response. How have some of the rest of you felt about that? I think it's a very, um, a real. Yeah, I, I, I could just respond. I actually felt the opposite. Uh, I feel that, and, and a lot of my work is studying uh, older texts. I'm working right now with a 10th century text, trying to translate it and interpret it. And I actually feel that this has given me um, an opportunity to just kind of slow down a little bit, to take some time to really understand it. Um, and then there's, you know, the internet and uh, Amazon, you know, Amazon Zindabad. I keep, you know, buying <laughs> books and <laughs> it's, huh? Yeah, so I don't know. For it's me, nice actually, I, I, yeah, I, I find this to be a wonderful moment to just think of scholarship in a different way. We're always, you know, thinking about traveling and going here and there to do our, you know, work. But if you just kind of sit in one place, it makes you sort of think and ruminate a little bit more about your work and engage with it in a different way. This said by someone who has spent a lot of time traveling between continents, actually. So it's very interesting. Yeah. That's true. I Others of you? You know, I can, I can just say in my own experience of hiding out here in Sag Harbor is that I'm, uh, I sort of came off of leave, but even during uh, being on leave, and I was still in that kind of traveling, running around mode, and it was only after um, COVID hit and I got back here and something that is evolving 
over months actually of sinking into reading, uh, you know, reading Derrida, reading, you know, and, and often in, in small groups or in conversation with, with students and po my postdocs and um, in a way that feels more like graduate school than any other time oh. has since I, you know, graduated and moved into a job, you know. The, and we're getting the sense from you, Kathy, that that's not a terrible thing. I think it's, yeah. Feel like you're in graduate great. school again. Oh my God. Yeah, no, it's, a, you know, that kind of concentration on really, um, I mean, I think that my experience in graduate school was creating a kind of mental map of, of the, you know, sort of, theoretical world out there, I guess. And I feel like now I'm able to go back and kind of fill it in a little more, move it, move it on. Um, and while I'm still, of course, thinking about my own uh, um, projects. Um, anyway, so, so yeah. I can, hear Aditi, of I can hear Aditi saying to herself, but, 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 but. Yeah. It's, yeah, Aaron Dati, would you were you going to say something? Yeah, on a similar note, uh, I am getting back to graduate school. Uh, I was working in India for IIT Bombay for four years, conducting research for them and field work for them, and uh, I was really looking forward to doing similar field work and research as a student, which is my own research. So now it's this uh, kind of backtrack from all of that and probably I'm getting hitting to secondary resources more and trying to, I don't know, probably spruce my research question more or something like that. But it's a little disappointing mm -hmm. uh, because working as a research professional and as a grad student is completely different. So it's kind of looking forward to that. Yeah. Indeed. And I can, I think I'm seeing that outside your window, it's dark. Yeah, I am in Madras right now. So that's what I thought. Um, <laughs> so, you know, just amazing that you can be here at all but the stress of of being you know awake at all times must be mm. deeply disconcerting yeah so uh, could i say something Fran, please yes um it's it's very remarkably see i'm i'm an emerita you guys who who don't know me um so i'm i'm retired and i'm what the the zooming that i do is more informal um it, and i should say you're a master of urdu <laughs> oh and no such anyway it includes uh we have an urdu poetry reading group that has shifted over to zoom and also of course everything that goes on at columbia mostly has shifted over to zoom and i want to point out also i mean with we all are aware of the problems and difficulties of that but i want to point out that there are there are very creative things happening in the interstices. For example, this particular group that we're in right now. It's not a course. It's not exactly a lecture. It's something new that hasn't existed before and could not exist without, without the mediation of Zoom. Yeah. And yet we all are going to find intellectual nourishment and stimulation and innovation and all the things we've been talking about in groups like this. I mean, maybe not, I mean, of course, we assume that we do find it in this particular group, but over time, I think there will develop a lot more. I've, I've certainly been seeing that in, in my own area. And there are sort of, in some cases, hybrids between academia and out of academia. They're, they're not official courses, but they have a lot of intellectual content because people, find each other who are serious about certain fields and topics. And so I think that whatever happens after the immediate menace of COVID is removed is certainly not going to be a reversion to the status quo. There's going to be a lot of new things that won't be given up. They'll be sort of accommodated. So some sort of a hybrid, some sort of a hybrid um, structure for our intellectual lives is undoubtedly going to take shape, but parts of that are very exciting, even if other parts of it are, are awful and lacking and um, 
vexatious, other parts of it are going to be are going to be thrilling. And you younger people, I think, will find the full scope and possibilities of that over time. So I want to say that as my contribution to the optimism side of the discussion. Although one, one thing I also would want to add um, is that you, Fran, have played a big role in using the internet, building a website that would make um, so Urdu sources more accessible, Urdu learning more accessible, and and aesthetically, um, a, a really strong positive ex aesthetic experience at the same time. Uh, so I recommend all of you take a look at Fran's um, website. I don't know if you have an address for it. <laughs> Uh, if, if you do a Google search for my name, it's the first thing that pops up and it has maps on it and texts and things like that. Um, so many of you might find something useful on it. Um, I work on it every day. I work on Ghalib and Mir, which of course is for me the heart of it. But there are many other more pragmatically useful parts of it that people have, have um, available to them. And, through it. And, and I do want to say uh, my usage figures have really increased since all this <laughs> stuff has started happening. Yeah. They weren't bad before. Well, no, Kathy? they weren't. Kathy, could I add to the uh, a graduate student perspective to this sort when? of turn, turn the frown upside down kind of COVID reactions as a graduate student? I've found that I've actually fallen back in love with my dissertation because one of the effects that this puts soon to be done PhD students in is pretty, a pretty bad job situation. And so suddenly because of the, I'm looking outside of academia for employment, I have to go back and say, how does this stuff have impact in the world? Who else is gonna care? How can I describe what I love and what I work on to people who, are not within the academy. All my friends used to say, oh, Quinn, he's doing some specific weird thing and I would never take the time to explain it. Now that I have to really think about why anybody else outside of our little community would care, I've actually fallen back in love with the topic. So, Fran, you were kind of talking about the optimistic uh, kind of angle here. I think this is another, and I would encourage graduate students to kind of remind ourselves wait, why do we get into this in the first place? Why does this cash out for anybody outside of Columbia? You know, so that's my, my little contribution. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I sort of feel like with, um, with the focus, I mean, we certainly, of course, could go back to a more detailed conversation about um, your recent work, Jack, but I think the, the tone of, of just thinking about our experience as scholars, which is what you know, really you were focusing on in your talk, I think encourages us, um, you know, has encouraged us to move into this other mode of, of again, reflecting on um, ourselves as people doing scholarship. And um, you know, it's a pretty is a pretty rare opportunity to do that as a as a as a group. So I, I strongly, given that we're in that mode. Um, I, I strongly encourage you to, um, you know, sort of share more. Um, we will be hearing from Rachel next week, um, so <laughs> but we're still would love to hear. <laughs> so you can save it for next week, or or, or speak about the personal side um, today, and and any of the rest of you, you know, the experience of of where you are at in these rather different. Um, stages of your career. Garaka, you're, you are also um, far away from our New York Center at the moment, aren't you? No, I'm just, I'm just here in Harlem. Oh, you're back. Oh, I'll, somehow I thought you were, you were off. Um, I mean, I was never able to leave. So I just, oh, you didn't leave. Oh. Yeah, I couldn't leave. Um, yeah. I would have left sometime this semester, but then uh, leaving uh, this semester was, I mean, my field site in India at least is not nothing's happening so so can you tell us you know how you're adjusting would you mind uh sure i mean i'm teeing yarnell's course which is something uh it's 
it's a very uh, odd pedagogical exercise uh, you know in like i don't know like meta cognition of how to choose sources to teach a course that's yes so that's all i'll say about that um but that's exciting in it's uh, in a very you know in a very different way from uh, the courses that i teed earlier on were like oh i was looking at syllabi and thinking about uh, you know why these why these sources were picked and uh, i did jack's hinduism and then i did an islamic masculine or yeah it was called muslim masculinities with derek and uh, so those were different kinds of courses this is a completely different kind of course but there's also the question of um, I mean, one of the things that I always think about is why so many students enroll in courses like Indo-Tibetan Buddhism, which are taught with this particular, um, uh, almost like a self-help mode, um, which is sort of different from a lot of religious studies courses that we have. So it's an interesting thing to see students in, in this course try to, I mean, my, I try to make them, you know, read Bob Thurman <laughs> critically and maybe skeptically. But uh, it's interesting to see that the Bob Thurman book, Inner Revolutions, is how it is received during COVID by undergraduate students, many of them freshmen who had plans to come here, didn't come here. Or if they came here, then they're in dorms and whatever they thought, uh, you know, uh, their education, college education was going to look like, it's very different and it's more isolating. And I mean, that poses its own dangers for how this course may be received. And you know, how, and it shapes the readings of a text like Thurman. And it's harder for like a TA like me to be both, uh, I guess, respectful of Yarnal's choices, but also push my students to question the sources and especially question Bob Thurman's narrative and his use of language and to like sort of push them to do a close reading, but over Zoom. So, you know, I cannot sway them with all my hand gestures. I have to do it on, <laughs> on screen. <laughs> yeah. um, so there's that. And uh, then otherwise I've been toying between picking one of two research projects based on how COVID pans out um, and what. So, 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 I, so I had comps and then I took a week off to pick one project. And now I'm going to you know, send Jack and Rachel an email after this with having picked one and with some, you know, stuff. So, I mean, it's, there's work. Uh, it is weird to do it all over uh, Zoom. I did have a question for Jack based off of, uh, so not the readings because I've asked Jack questions about this book in other talks um, already. So um, I have a question, Jack, what you, based on what you said that like about your interest in English when you were majoring in history. It's a very, so I wondered if, you know, if you were ever looking for um, projects that you could perhaps do without, you know, within the COVID limitations, um, maybe it would be really good to like have someone like you do uh, like a reception history of um, Yeats or even Shelley and, and the influence of Blake and their connections with the Theosophical Society. Um, and, and there's like, you know, my own interest in this is the astrology part where like Yeats was very into astrology and he had his little ghost club. Um, but I think you might be situated in a particularly uh, useful position to sort of revisit that, uh, you know, like even in terms of, and I know we talked about this last week with like disciplines and the history of uh, the formation of disciplines in South Asia compared to disciplines in uh, North America and the sort of prominence of that uh, of of Yeats of like even and, and I've seen an Auden on your shelf so I know but that that entire lineage of literature and how it is received and um, repackaged in South Asia from the you know against the background of both like as post colonial education and and also um, religion. Do we hear a course that uh, Gaurika Mehta also ought to be teaching? That's <laughs> here. Uh, I know you have a few other things to do. It's very nice to hear that Quinn is in love with his dissertation because you're going to be in love with yours too, whichever one it turns out to be. You are eager to hear. Uh, my, I, boy, this sounds like a wonderful thing to do. And my, uh, my immediate reaction is, oh, let's make it a three-person course. Let's pull in Gauri, 
Gaudi Viswanathan, and you'll be someone, and you'll be able to talk especially about what it's like to, uh, about how this has mattered in, in, in your formation too. You're very conscious of sort of disciplinary differences between uh, India and the United States. And if I could listen in, I would be thrilled to do so. Great. Yeah, I, should, I should mention that for those who are taking the actual course for credit, we talked about Gauri Vishwanathan's work um, last week. Uh, so this is, you know, there are, there are echoes for Good. us. Yeah. Thanks for that idea. Yeah. So other thoughts of, as people are, you know, how, how I guess that, that would be um, the question is how specifically has the current situation with COVID shaped your plans moving forward? And I know a couple of you actually are, you know, we're planning to um, begin you know, a, a pro program at Columbia in the fall and ended up deferring um, so that you're not actually, um, uh, you know, on campus yet. Uh, others are at, at very different stages of your, of your career. So it, I think it would be really interesting to hear um, the uh, intellectual adaptations you're, you're making. Mm -hmm. Any willingness to Aditi. I guess my, my fear is that we we found so many solutions um, that we've somehow dislocated India or South Asia um, from the study itself and and so I, I in my day to day have been trying to connect much more with modern India which has been something that I haven't thought a lot about at all um, but now I primarily listening to All India Radio um, when I'm sitting at home. And just because it, it has been, it feels very important and also ethical for me to not forget that there is this real place. And even though I can't see or hear or engage with this real place that it's there. Um, but it's almost like we've built these systems of highways by which we can just zoom past it um, and find different ways of connecting that are meaningful and important and, and helpful. They are so helpful and so utilitarian, but there's some dislocation that's happening. And, and that at the crux of it is where my, my discomfort comes from, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. Um. So, um, you know, sort of going back actually, um, well, I'm just thinking about that dislocation and comfort, but discomfort, but also, um, you know, Gorka, you're saying that you're designing a different proposal now. Um, can you want to share with us or what you're, you know, kind uh, of- Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my original project was based on uh, possession and, and it, and Mahavidya goddesses. And so there was a textual aspect which was tracing these textual genealogies of various um, modern um, or early modern texts to, their, to other Sanskrit texts and, and, and the sort of linguistic debates about this within the community. And then the ethnographic aspect was, um, you know, stuff on possession. And um, I was in India for, like I took a semester off to study Kannada. And while I was doing that, I got some time to sort of just do preliminary field work. But of course, when I did the preliminary field work, it was with the idea that this is very preliminary. So I never, you know, I was lax with writing down field notes and I didn't interview all the people I could interview. It was still very much like a making connections and, you know, uh, and uh, then when I got back here, since I can't go back uh, for now, given the, you know, co I guess India is on its way to surpass the US in COVID cases. Um, and then um, surely we've all read about like the Modi government's bad handling of funds and healthcare and the collapse of healthcare. And like, so um, uh, I, one of my interlocutors passed away, which led me to sort of reconsider how viable that project really was going to be uh, given the lack of uh, you know unlimited lifelong funding for this project uh, so 
I did have, I had done um, some work on the Guyanese Mariamman temple in New York for a, a semester and then on and off for a year. And that was always a sort of side project. And um, Guyana has a better um, COVID situation. They have 92 deaths and 3000 cases, but they're on their way to sort of you know, becoming a, a, a non-threatening place where people can go to for mm -hmm. just, for, you know, travel that's not just essential. Um, since ethnography is not listed as essential travel uh, by the CDC. Uh, and so, so, so there's a possibility that if I spent my spring semester um, doing some more field work here, then I could get like a really good amount of stuff on how possession is shaped. Uh, there's already a sort of larger narrative of disease, but specifically in times of COVID. And particularly since like New York City was a, a global epicenter, you have a global epicenter, COVID, possession. So there's a, you know, there, I can spend a semester doing that and then leave in the fall, hopefully with a grant uh, to be in Guyana for a year and maybe spend the, the last bit of that doing archival work. So since it is like the, the Indo-Caribbean community has, um, has a, so there's a lot of like theory of memory, which now I've been sort of revisiting because of this shift in project. Uh, but there's uh, a lot of like ship logs and archives like that. And some of them are actually at UPenn. So there's a possibility I could even get to that before I can go to Guyana, maybe, you know, as early as January or December. So there are uh, other archives. And uh, then finally, the last, uh, the, the tricky part of the archive would be to go, to be able to go to Delhi, where they have archives from 1917 when indentured labor was abolished. And, um, and they have like Congress proceedings about this. So there's some archives there and, and particularly the prominence of Madan Mohal Malviya, who's, um, you know, whose writings they have there and letters they have there, who was prominent in this, in the abolition movement uh, and the setting up of Hindu Sabhas, which then led to establishment of Arya Samaj in, in the Caribbean. And that had repercussions for caste and Mariamman worship particularly, which got outlawed under the Obeya Act, which has a larger. So uh, one of the challenges of this is that I'm shifting into a whole new, like the, the outer structure of this research is diaspora studies, migration studies, global South studies, and um, you know, like uh, Atlantic theory or, uh, and also Africana theory. So, and some critical race theory. So the, the, scaf the theoretical scaffolding has sort of shifted. So there's some adaptation to, you know, this new literature, which is exciting. Um, but just in response to Aditi, I wanted to say that um, though there has been a sort of like geographical dislodging of, uh, of South Asia, or and or wherever whatever locations that we study from um, from our work that is a, that's like still a sort of it's an experiential uh, it's that's the experiential or reflex, reflexive aspect of that research on the other hand like i i did attend uh, mark who's a grad was i guess now a grad student in our department and who defended uh, the semester and mark i went to one of his, yeah and i went to one of his talks and uh, it and you know he had shifted his uh, project to become uh, extremely public facing and and uh, it centered important narratives of slavery and things like that from South Asia so uh, and he's working on an archive project which um, and that project involves working with some uh, you know people who are geographically distanced from us so in that way I do think that um, I mean I'm not of the school that like COVID has brought us all together because we have technology but <laughs> there is a sort of different, uh, you know, methodological practice now to, to, center, to center something without necessarily geographically centering it, which I'm sure you're aware of, but, you know, even with, um, like recently in India, there's been um, so many arrests with UAPA. And after that, the, the you know, like right now, there's this, uh, the rape case where the evidence was destroyed, right? So, uh, in a sense, what it would mean to center South Asia might mean to, you know, I, I think that the future of scholarship might be more public facing because of COVID and that could be a good thing. I, if I could just say, I wanted to go back to a note that, that Fran sounded, um, having to do with being in touch with people 
uh, through Zoom or whatever the means would be, WhatsApp, uh, who are actually in South Asia. If there's a, I'm thinking of um, Manpreet Kaur, whose dissertation is down in Chicago, whose dissertation is on Farid uh, and his reception. She has found herself, that's to say she has found, she's helped to establish a reading group around Farid that involves people who are in, in various continents. And the core group actually is in South Asia. So of course it means time zones and all of that, but, but, uh, but it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. And um, if there is, uh, sometimes it, it may involve, um, as they say, reaching out to people who you think might know who the right persons would be for, uh, to take your case as an example, it'd be for you to be in conversation with uh, in South Asia or in India, if you don't have those instincts yourself. Um, um, some communities have fallen apart, but, uh, but others are, are waiting to be open. I love it that you're listening to all of your India radio. That's terrific. <laughs> Yeah, another thing that I think um, not all students necessarily know about is um, things like dissertation writing groups. And I think also at the MA level, MA thesis writing groups can be very helpful. Um, and so if um, one of the things that I would like to do as, um, you know, with the, my focus on the South Asia Institute is maybe acting somehow as a, um, a vehicle for helping people connect with other people who might, you know, share um, maybe the interest in South Asia generally is too broad or maybe not, but an interdisciplinary um, writing groups that, um, you know, we could um, work on building together, especially at this time that obviously would happen on Zoom um, but uh, if you are interested in anything like that or know other people who don't happen to be here right now but might be interested, um, you know, please let me know. Um, and I will also um, send an announcement out um, to help facilitate these conversations that may help people get involved. An aspect that I didn't touch on in talking about this climate course that I'm in is the unbelievable contribution that's being made by Mohit Kesi as a TA, but Mo Mohit is actually in Mumbai. So it's not so easy for him. It happens very late at night for him and it's not been easy. But uh, through his own personal experience and because he is in that time zone and you know, <laughs> listening to All India Radio, whether he wants to or not, uh, he opens up to uh, the rest of us avenues that we just wouldn't have without his presence. It's been amazing to see how that can happen. It's not effortless, but, uh, but quite amazing. And of course, he's also talked about his own work, so but that's another story altogether. One thing I wanted to mention, um, though it's not a, an official part of this um, master class um, series, uh, is that next Tuesday, um, at the same time, 10 to 12, in connection with the um, Middle East Institute's um, course, sort of the equivalent course for Middle East that, that this one is for South Asia, I'll actually be speaking on um, uh, my new edited, co-edited volume, um, Modern Sufis and the State in South Asia. Um, so if you are interested in uh, sort of, and th this is a book that just came out this summer, um, if you're interested in Jesus, um, email, let me know, and I can have you added to the list. Um, I, I don't imagine that Catherine Poots, uh, Spellman Poots, who is, who's running that course, um, would mind, uh, you know, I've told her that my students will be joining. So um, yeah, just let me know. And uh, there's, there are also, you know, sort of a s small selection of readings for that um, talk as well. Um, 
So um, I think maybe with that, unless somebody else would like to add something to the conversation, um, we will next week, same time, same place, we will be hearing from Rachel McDermott, um, who is in the second row on my screen right now. Um, <laughs> and um, so she, the readings for her um, class are already posted in the Google Drive. Um, so you can take a look at those. Uh, we're really eager to hear, um, you know, your, your most recent work and, um, you know, something of your, the trajectory of how you got to the project that you're working on now. Um, and we will uh, engage uh, with the issues that you're facing as you, as you um, bring this project together. So, um, I don't know if you want to give us a preview or have anything to say about, uh, or. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, you're, you're on mute. It will be great to see you next week if you can come. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, it's great to see you all and um, you know, I'm here, so if you have any thoughts, ideas, questions, uh, feel free to get in touch. And we'll see you next week at, um, it's, it's sort of between 10 and 10.10, you know, classes start at 10.10. We're sort of officially starting at 10 here, but usually takes a few minutes to get the speaker in the room and make sure everything's working okay. But uh, anyway, we'll look forward to seeing you at 10 o'clock next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.